The Gospel according to John. Jesus said to Nicodemus, The Son of Man must be lifted up, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Because God loved the world so much that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not be lost, but may have eternal life. For God sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but so that through him the world may be saved. No one who believes in him will be condemned, but whoever refuses to believe is condemned already, because he has refused to believe in the name of God's only Son. On these grounds is sentence pronounced, that, through, that though the light has come into the world, men have shown they prefer darkness to the light because their deeds were evil. And they, everybody who does wrong hates the light and avoids it for fear his actions should be exposed. But the man who lives by the truth comes out into the light so that it may be plainly seen that what he does is done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. The imperfect believer is a title that gives the impression of one who has fallen by the wayside in a life of faith. Sometimes people who associate the term as coming up short identifying it with some particular moral weakness or even a compromise in belief. The imperfect believer is not an orthodox believer and is therefore dismissed. The other side of it, maybe, is that the imperfect believer is in some way the perfect believer. For example, in the moment when the father of the newly cured child says, I believe, help my unbelief. Are we in fact listening to a person in the fullness of belief? The belief that what has occurred has occurred through the divine action, but unsure and not yet prepared for the thing still to come. Recognition of divine action puts us in a position for the outside creating God has an effect on the turbulent believer on the inside of us. The next step is whether this becomes visible in our own outside actions. In the gospel passage this week, we begin with Jesus speaking to Nicodemus, which in some way can be misleading. Jesus is no longer talking to an individual, but a whole room of people and essentially his followers down through time. There may, in fact, be an argument for saying that Nicodemus has already left the room with no great fanfare, very much like the way this wily and crafty individual arrived in the dark. Nicodemus could have spoken to Jesus at any time in the temple, but he has chosen nighttime possibly trying to keep in with two groups without committing himself to either. One group is the Pharisees to whom he belongs and their police force who are on the lookout for the movements of Jesus. Nicodemus knows where Jesus is, but it doesn't look like he has told anyone. Then to Jesus and his mission, He declares his amazement at his signs and at his wonders. Is this a man trying to have two masters but his own terms? The conversation with Jesus takes a strange twist when Nicodemus, in similar words, says, but I don't know what you're talking about. The response from Jesus is even shorter, but by changing the words and keeping the sentiment, the response is effectively, well, you should. 
Later, we find the evangelist reintroducing Nicodemus on two occasions in the gospel. One of these occasions, it seems as if he's still hedging his bets. He doesn't defend Jesus, but does remind his fellow Pharisees that Jesus deserves a fair trial, for which he is ridiculed. Then we find him at the laying of Jesus in the tomb, where he has spent a lot of money on providing myrrh and aloes. But other than that, is he there as a believer or a Pharisee, saying that the burial rites are completed correctly? Equally, why use his name? An idea may be that the people to first hear this gospel may have known about Nicodemus. No one listening to this gospel would have been sitting on the edge of his or her seats waiting to find out what happens next. Does Jesus escape from Jerusalem with his life or not? The people who are listening now, they know how the story ends. What they require are characters within the gospel to whom they can relate. Is it good to have this figure whose motivations are hard to detect, an imperfect searcher comes across as a warning of the dangers of disbelief. Taking the opposite view, we can ponder on the fact that he may be an example of the imperfect believer whom we are invited to become. If we take a few moments to look at the actual first encounter between Jesus and Nicodemus, an artist's impression of what may have occurred will give us more things to ponder. No artist can give a true representative of the event, but an artist can provide details that may stir greater awareness within us. The painting I have chosen is by Matthias Storm. I'm not sure who he is either. But of the many paintings out there, this one has a certain character in the encounter and equally great teaching within the painting, assisting us in our ongoing understanding of Jesus. The first thing to notice is the stare between the two. Like watching a tennis match, as the action goes from one side to the other. Then the two books, one for the law, the other for the prophets. And Nicodemus showing that he has flicked through pages, looking for the meaning to what Jesus says. The indications of who Jesus is are found in the manner he holds his hand. It is the recognized symbol for orthodoxy and thus truth. His other hand touching the base of the candle makes it clear that Jesus is the light. And with his stare, he is drawing out from Nicodemus the belief that Jesus is the way. Nicodemus' eyes are surrounded by wrinkles, letting us know that he has been looking for the way, the light, and the truth for some time. As we now turn to what Jesus is saying to the rest of the room in this week's gospel, we find many and varied phrases. The Son of Man, raised up like Moses in the desert, eternal life may not be lost. God loved the world, everyone who believes not to condemn, refuses to believe the light into the world, prefer darkness, action should be exposed, lives by the truth, and what he does is done in God. These comments seem to be tripped over as the passage is read, arriving at the end and being overwhelmed by what has just been heard can mean that very little is taken in. The intention of the evangelist is not so much to tell us what Jesus said, but to tell us who Jesus is and our place in who he is. 
Jesus is being clear to those in the room. But are those in the room really clear who they are in the life of Jesus? To discover who he is in their lives, there is a requirement in their part to give up old ways of seeing and discover new visions. The person who is right for him is the one who is required to look up from his or her continuous view of the world that comes through the eyes of a head that is weighed down by weariness and trial. In a way, he describes how people are enslaved permanently, fixed on the shadows of the struggle of life and finding it difficult to look up at the vision he provides. The generous God is presented to us in the way he gives his only son, so that whoever believes may have eternal life. A mustard seed of faith is all that he requests, and with this mustard seed, eternal life is ours. We are not condemned if we believe, but if we refuse to believe, then we are condemned. These are tough words. If we believe, then we participate in all the virtues of eternal life. We act with justice, forgive immediately, and are true. Then we enter into his promised life. And refusing to believe in justice, along with no desire to forgive and avoiding the truth, we condemn ourselves. We don't act for the good of all. And how could we, if we have meanness of heart, Truth would be manipulated to justify our actions. And with our actions justified, we create a cycle where there is no need to offer forgiveness or accept it. This is a life lived in darkness, not lived in God. As we have said, Nicodemus' words with Jesus are the preparation for this week's gospel. And Nicodemus is a man who says he is impressed then says he doesn't understand. In the statement of not understanding, in fact, a refusal to understand, or are these words the words of a searcher seeking to understand and so desire eternal life? Nicodemus desires and at the same time refuses, which ultimately leaves him in the shadows of darkness. Like searchers, we can, with sincerity, still ask, is this a bad thing? The scenario is not a good thief or bad thief presentation. This is simply a human lost in the drama of being saved, a drama that needs many ingredients if it is to rise to a new way of life, ingredients that may be at hand while others are still to be found. The beginning is a solid ingredient of humility that before God, whom we encounter in the gospel, over the centuries, people of great holiness have constantly repeated before God the great Jesus prayer that declares, have mercy on me, Lord, a sinner. Used by those seeking holiness from the time of those early Christians. To sweeten life, we require an encounter with God that comes from this humble heart, the ability to sift through our life while looking upon the good and the bad. Now sweetened by the forgiveness of God, we undertake the initiative of God and aim to follow through with his plan for us. Our nutrition is his word which we are stepping through in these final weeks of Lent. Listening to the many declarations of Jesus' faith in his Father. It is his faith that we are called to have faith in. All this is warmed in the presence of prayer. Prayer said in repetition, prayer held in reflection, prayer existing in silence. Let's not be fooled, though, and go back to the beginning and remember that we are imperfect believers. Gazing down like the people of Israel at the serpents on the surface of the sand, obsessed with the temptations of life. 
then to suddenly be told that it is now time to raise our eyes from these serpents, that we step around and look up with a confidence at something that has never happened before. The Son of God being lifted up. Imperfect believers that we are, we will see our salvation.